perspectives on the Belt Road Initiative from India and Africa. And this time we're really like international and uh, because Pierrot will present his paper uh, in French and will be translated after by uh, Sarah. And so um, I just want to briefly introduce the speakers today. We have uh, Mr. Uh, Wittenbach, who's, uh, who works at the European External Action Service and he holds a PhD from Duisburg Essen University. And he published uh, widely on EU-China relations and China global policy. Uh, then we have uh, Professor uh, Piero, who's a social, social economist and sinologist, uh, is an Emeritus Research Director at France National Center of Scientific Research and at the Research Center on Modern and Contemporary China at the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences. He published, uh, uh, he's a very prolific writer, and he published like, in a peer review journal on social economic issues uh, related to China. And I think if you're interested in um, uh, his studies on Sino-African relations, you can check his website, uh, perot.fr slash Pina, Pina, but after we can, I mean, actually it's already in the program. And the last speaker will be uh, Professor, uh, professor uh, Singh, uh, that is Professor and Dean of Guru Gobind Singh uh, Intraprashta University, and she also wrote uh, a lot uh, on law poverty and development and corporate law. So welcome you, and uh, I welcome uh, uh, Mr. Alessandro too. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I uh, will not focus on the big picture like the other presentations. Uh, not a deductive approach from the BRI down to uh, the countries. But I will focus on an inductive approach, a, a case study. And uh, it's basically the sort of the size of my fingernail here. Uh, it's a railroad from Mombasa port. Uh, to Nairobi, and it's supposed to go a bit further inland into into um, Central Africa. Um, I was actually in Kenya visiting the construction site over the time it's been constructed, spoke to, to managers, workers, and politicians, and so on. So it's a real bottom-up case study, and I want to uh, report from 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 the bottom up, so to speak, uh, to complement what has been said uh, previously um, by the other speakers. But just to put it into a little bit of a historical context. I mean, Mombasa was basically a city founded by the Portuguese, uh, and there was a, a fort there uh, from 1596 called Jesus, and now since 2017 there is a uh, Chinese train station there too. Uh, and obviously this was a stepping stone for the Portuguese to go over Oman and all that to Macau. Um, so there is also a historic connection, I think, that um, uh, forget because uh, the local people obviously remember these things. Yeah. So my, my approach is to look at actually the mega project that has been built and, and uh, to look at the mega project literature to understand how does it actually work to get a mega project going. Um, and I think every sort of everybody knows that how to make a project in one's country that doesn't really go as planned. I mean, I'm from Germany, we've been trying to do the airport in Berlin for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, and still not open. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Channel Tunnel has never made a, uh, money, and a few other mega projects in your countries, I'm sure you can think about them. And, in fact, there is a lot of research on mega projects, uh, and most of the research actually focuses on their failure. In fact, quite interesting. I mean, uh, maybe, maybe. But most of the literature basically tells you why they don't work out as planned. Uh, there must be something there which is a bit uncomfortable. Uh, the thing. So, um, one leading author on, on, on this, after examining a database of worldwide projects, concluded that more than 70% are uh, failing in their objectives and that all mega projects are united by the extreme complexity and a long record of poor delivery. So, good luck to China. When you look at the map, they're getting through a lot of problems. Um, another author um, put them quite poetically, um, described mega projects as colossal, captivating, costly, controversial, and complex. So, uh, clearly, um, we should be surprised that a lot of mega projects produce a lot of challenges, and especially if they involve foreign, foreign participation and so on and so forth. So to put that sort of up front, I think it's very important. 
Now, I also came across a Kenyan, and I'm talking about Kenyan here, a Kenyan commentator who wrote just recently, if you assume the worst and bet that the leaders you elect, and Kenya is a country where leaders get elected, it's not an authoritarian regime as we uh, heard just now, uh, so, and you bet that the leaders you elect will be corrupt, the projects announced with much fanfare will not be built on time, if at all, and their cost will be inflated by thieving officials, you are likely to be proved right. So this is the context uh, of, let's say, uh, Kenya um, uh, and China, in, in which this mega project, this train, uh, was built from Mombasa port to Nairobi, the capital, about 470 kilometers of track, and uh, as, as I said, I've actually seen it being built uh, in three years. Quite fascinating that it was actually finished on time, and as the train is actually running, it's very popular. To put the whole uh, sort of story a little bit into context of the worries, um, this came this morning on my, my Twitter feed from one of my friends, the uh, uh, cartoonist uh, in, in Kenya, and he see President Kenyatta sitting at a table with Xi Jinping and uh, Trump. And Theresa May was in Kenya yesterday uh, trying to uh, sell business contracts. And you see, um, somehow, I think, resume the concerns that we have in Europe about what's going on there. Now, um, but it also shows um, Kenyatta was just returning from Washington, where he agreed a road contract with an with the, with the American company, Vesto, for the same track from Mombasa to Nairobi, a, a highway, which is going to be a toll road. Uh, he's going next week to Beijing, to Foka to get the secured uh, loan for, for the next tranche of the train going further towards uh, inland and towards uh, Uganda. Uh, so the cartoon sums it up. I don't need more words. I think it's, it's clear that there's a contest uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, geopolitical, geoeconomic proportions. But it's also the situation they're in. They have a diversity of, of actors they can turn to for their development projects and infrastructure projects. Well, why did they want to have a train in the first place? Well, the last train that was built there was uh, 115 years ago. It was called the Lunatic Express because uh, <laughs> of the high cost of the project, and no, it didn't make sense uh, to the people at the time. Now, the Brits built that train because it was a, it was a strategic uh, a, a railroad to, to allow access to, to Uganda and the economy there and to secure it. Now, the fact that we have the capital of Nairobi um, is due to uh, a railway camp actually being opened at the time. So the long-term development impacts of such infrastructure cannot really be uh, uh, summed up in a feasibility study like the World Bank does, like, well, what will happen next year, how much money will you earn on this railway? Uh, if the railway hadn't been there, uh, half of the cities in Kenya would actually not be there. So just to put that a little bit into proportion, now there was a way, of course, you could upgrade that old railway, but that, for the politicians in power, didn't really seem like the best idea. A colonial railway upgrade with more money from the World Bank? Nah, I want to have my own railway, you know, with a standard gauge, and it looks nice and stuff. No? So, development is not necessarily the sustainable development goals for these people. It's also wealth, power, prestige, and so on and so forth. So, it's very, very difficult to judge now, today, what that railway will, will entail for Kenya. It's definitely a long-term long -term issue. So what I want to focus today on is really on how did they actually manage to build it and to finish it on time, because all those mega projects, as I said earlier, are basically doomed to fail. Um, and I don't want to fall into generalizations on, on, on the, on the China-Africa context with the predators and, and partners and stuff, because you know, you've seen that they have now basically diversity of choice. Now, what, what happened was that the Kenyan government, first of all, um, uh, made a contract with the Chinese and the uh, 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 company, Chinese um, Road Bridge uh, Company, it's an SOE that has been active in Kenya for some time building roads. And actually they were active building roads at the invitation of the Kenyan government since 2003 because they had blacklisted most of their own contractors as corrupt. So the territory of Chinese company to actually be able to build roads. And for the railways, it's the same. And since the Kenyans hadn't built a railway for uh, many, many years, um, 115 to be precise, they obviously didn't have any capacity to do so. So what is the value 
uh, for a country like, like Kenya that hasn't got the capacity to do it themselves, doesn't have the money available, well, they have to borrow the money and they have to get the capacity. So they have to fill institutional voids, uh, as you can call it. So refer back to Professor Gao this morning with the institutions. So it's not so much as a good institution as a bad institution, but you sort of need to build up these institutional capacities in the first place in order to, to be able to deliver that infrastructure project. So the, what, the, what the Kenyan government president basically did was, I want to have this railway done in my first term of office. I want to show off with it. So I know that I know my bureaucracy. If I go through the normal channels, it will never work. So he set up a presidential delivery unit. Uh, certain Tony Blair was there in town a bit earlier and had advised him on how wonderful that is. Um, so the presidential delivery unit was, was assembling all these sort of major ministries and the contractors. And they were basically piloting the whole project with the president being really invested personally in this thing. And this would made it happen on time because there were so many problems and challenges on the way uh, that had to be solved. And this high level hierarchical structure to organize the project was able to overcome these, uh, these conflicts. For instance, ethnic conflicts when, where the locals were protesting that their group didn't get enough jobs uh, on the construction side. Where, uh, another group was, was privileged, these kind of things were sorted out like that. The drawback uh, in terms of the contracts was that nobody actually knows what is in the contract. They're commercial contracts, and as they are <coughs> commercial contracts, they're not open, uh, I mean, Western companies, they wouldn't publish their commercial contracts. They're not open to scrutiny. So it's very, very difficult to see, are these contracts sort of negotiated fairly and what's the real cost of it, that is not clear. Uh, it can only be deduced that uh, the railway was more costly than it could have been, because there's an, uh, another railway built in Ethiopia uh, that I had the privilege to ride on in, in June. Quite funny, because even the tickets are exactly like in China, on pink paper. Um, and this railway was a lot cheaper uh, per kilometer than the Kenyan one. So there's lots of arguments about that, but nobody can really check did they go to do a deal or not on the cost. But then during the construction, there was also this problem of access to, to procurement that has come up earlier also in the, in the talks. So uh, a lot of Kenyan companies that had capacity to deliver at least some of the stuff that they needed, like cement, um, they were pushing uh, to get access to these markets and say, okay, we can produce that cement according to the standards that the Chinese need, so why don't we take our cement? And they lobbied the president and they got actually access to the market and they, the company, then, the Chinese company, then sourced all the cement uh, from the Kenyan uh, cement industry. So there is access uh, and a possibility. The companies are willing, uh, probably they were also ca calculating the cost of importing the cement from China and so on and so forth. But clearly the, the business model is that the Chinese company has its contractors and subcontractors and knows how much it costs, uh, where the profits are, and that that is the package. If then somebody comes from the outside and says, hey, I want to share of it, it's a bit difficult. So I think you need to, to, to do this up front. Otherwise, it's very, very difficult to, to obviously go into a business model with a contract uh, that has been signed. And the contract that had been signed was um, that the Chinese would deliver on time because the president wanted this thing to be ready before the next election. So they clearly there were penalties and all that. I heard that from the Chinese managers. If they were late, uh, they would have penalties. And therefore, clearly, they were interested in getting the thing done on time. So the priority was set by the Kenyan government, not the Chinese. The Kenyan government wanted that thing to be ready on time. So if the Chinese were then confronted with, OK, we work with a local company that doesn't have the capacity, that slows us down, of course, we're not working with that company. If we could work with a company that can deliver, fine. So I think it's very important to understand the, the, the leverage that the, company, that, that the local government has and the agency uh, in this um, in this project, and, and actually, uh, my 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 point in that point here is the agency of the African government here, the Kenyan government, is actually fairly high because they can choose three different competitors, and they have to deal with some of the issues, uh, and that's not issues that come just from from China or from the BI, and a lot of the issues that they have to deal with are local issues, and I think that is very very important. When we look at BI projects, is to look at the context. It's it's not the Chinese model BI that produces governance outcomes in terms of bad or good institutions. 
it's the interaction between the partners on the ground that produces these development outcomes and the institutional outcomes. When I wrote my paper two, two months ago um, and sent it in, uh, um, there was a line in there which said where the land acquisition uh, for this project, which was left to the Kenyan government to organize, uh, ballooned out of control. Uh, I had budgeted something like $8 million and we ended up with $320 million for land compensation. And I was uh, saying in my paper, well, there's a, there's a tradition in Kenya of big scale corruption, um, which is also mentioned in that, in that combat I commented earlier. And uh, just in time for my paper here, uh, today um, I, I read a couple of days ago that the managing director of Kenya Rail, um, the chairman of the National Land Commission, seven other officials have been arrested for corruption uh, um, in the context of land deals uh, that uh, with the train. So clearly, the corruption is a local problem. The Chinese were very clever, saying, oh, we're not going to deal with land issues, because knowing from working on the roads in Kenya, they knew exactly what was going to happen. Um, so they left it to the Kenyan government. And the Kenyan government, well, they did it the, the way it was done. Um, the city officials thought this is their day, and they um, made a lot of money. So <laughs> now they've been caught, and therefore we have um, uh, clearly an issue on the Kenyan side and how to how to organize the government, the governments um, here on their side. So I think the the, the lesson from this uh, my brief talk here in the paper is that the local agency is very very important to look at when we want to evaluate development outcomes of any of those projects. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Bonjour à tout le monde. Je tiens à remercier les organisateurs de m'avoir autorisé à faire ma communication en anglais. Euh, le diaporama que vous avez à voir sous les yeux, lui, communication en français, non. le diaporama est en anglais, de même que le document que j'ai posé. Je vais commencer par une carte, ce n'est pas original, mais c'est pour situer géographiquement euh, l'Afrique par rapport euh, aux routes de la soie, aux routes terrestres et aux routes maritimes. Euh, ces routes de, de la soie sont visiblement orientées vers l'Europe, plus exactement l'Europe euh, de l'Union Européenne, et euh, ne font que par la route maritime tangenter l'Afrique. Géographiquement, a priori donc, l'Afrique n'est pas directement incluse dans les routes de la soie. Route maritime, donc, c'est le problème du trafic maritime, c'est le problème du transport par conteneur, et j'ai essayé par ce graphique de vous illustrer l'importance que l'Afrique peut avoir dans le trafic par conteneur. Vous voyez que 57% du trafic de conteneurs et 45% de la valeur de ce trafic se fait à destination de l'Asie, se fait à 15% à destination de l'Europe, mais dans ce schéma, l'Afrique ne compte que 4% du trafic de conteneurs et pour 4% de la valeur. Donc, même si nous avons une route maritime qui tangente l'Afrique aujourd'hui, le résultat des relations économiques qui sont établies par ce biais ne peuvent être que excessivement minimes. De toute façon, du point de vue du volume global des échanges, le commerce avec l'Afrique, c'est 3% du commerce mondial et c'est la même proportion que représente l'Afrique dans le commerce avec la Chine. Alors, si maintenant j'ajoute les remarques qu'ont pu faire, par exemple, le ministre, le ministre des Affaires étrangères Wang Yi, ou encore plus récemment, lundi dernier, le président Xi Jinping, qui considère que les routes de la soie sont d'abord et avant tout une stratégie économique, je pourrais presque dire que mon exposé est terminé à ce niveau-là. Alors, d'une part, j'ai une mission qui m'a été confiée par Jean-Christophe de Frey, je suis donc obligé d'aller au-delà, et puis je suis obligé de constater que dans le discours même 
euh, des dirigeants chinois. Euh, il y a un développement qui a été évoqué tout à l'heure quand on a parlé euh, de la grande harmonie sous le ciel, en reprenant le, le vocabulaire impérial, mais aussi le fait qu'un certain nombre de pays africains ont reçu une étiquette à des titres variés comme appartenant ou participant au développement des routes de la soie, ce qui m'oblige d'aller un petit peu plus avant et essayer de comprendre cette situation. Pour regarder cette situation, j'ai regardé d'abord quelle était la situation au regard des flux d'investissement. Et ce que je constate, c'est que en, en termes de tendance, depuis 2003, qui est le moment où la Chine s'ouvre et pratique l'investissement à destination de l'étranger de façon plus importante, hein, vous avez des courbes de tendance qui sont toutes sauf une des courbes de tendance croissantes. Alors effectivement, si on regarde la situation de l'Afrique, l'Afrique a commencé à avoir une situation, on nous enviable comme destination des flux d'investissement chinois, mais au cours des années, la tendance s'est renversée, et aujourd'hui, de, de ces trois dernières années, ce que l'on constate, c'est non seulement une diminution relative de l'investissement chinois à destination de l'Afrique, mais des discriminations, une redémission absolue. En d'autres termes, du point de vue de l'investissement, s'il est regardé du point de vue chinois, à partir des statistiques chinoises, il est tout à fait clair que les flux ne montrent pas que l'Afrique soit une destination privilégiée, malgré ce qui peut en être dit. Mais si on avait un peu plus avant. Là, j'ai pris non plus les flux, mais les stocks. Et j'ai pris les données calculées par Eurostat. Et ce que vous voyez, c'est que la Chine aurait constitué un stock d'investissement aujourd'hui qui serait d'un niveau tout à fait comparable au niveau d'investissement de la France. Cela nous apprend deux choses. Ça nous apprend d'abord une première chose, c'est que tous ces pays investissent tous très peu en Afrique. Donc, en fait, n'accorde pas à l'Afrique une importance économique considérable. Deuxième chose, c'est que du fait même que la Chine ait pu rattraper son retard par rapport aux autres pays, ça en fait un acteur qui est devenu un acteur important pour l'Afrique. Et vous voyez que par cette constatation, je suis en train de changer de point de vue. À une route, si route de la soie il y a, il y a le regard que peut avoir la Chine, mais il peut aussi avoir le regard que peut avoir l'Afrique. Pour continuer dans cette veine-là, je me suis intéressé aux échanges. Oui, évidemment, je peux faire ces choses très rapidement. Les échanges ont considéré, à juste titre, que euh, la Chine utilisait l'Afrique comme un, un lieu d'approvisionnement en matière première et en combustible. Alors effectivement, si on additionne les importations chinoises venant d'Afrique de minéraux, de, de, de métaux et de combustibles, on a à peu près 85% des importations chinoises en importation de Pour chacun de ces, pour, pour, de, de ces, de ces deux catégories, j'ai fourni trois, les trois pays africains qui exportent le plus de cette catégorie de produits à destination de la Chine, et à chaque fois, ces trois pays, ça représente 80% du montant. Mais avec une différence considérable. Pour les minerais et les métaux, l'Afrique du Sud exporte 50% de ce que porte l'Afrique. La Zambie arrive derrière avec 14% et le Congo avec 14%. Pour le fuel, pour les combustibles, l'Angola, c'est pratiquement les deux tiers. Le Congo, Brazzaville, 10%. Et 7% pour le Sud-Soudan cette année-là. Ça peut paraître énorme. Mais si on regarde ce que ça représente effectivement pour la Chine, alors effectivement, l'Afrique du Sud, c'est 5%, c'est conséquent. L'Angola, 8%, c'est conséquent. Mais le deuxième et le troisième dans chacune catégorie, ça ne représente plus que 1%. En fait, ce que représente économiquement l'Afrique, de ce point de vue-là, c'est un, c est, c est, c est la, elle, expli, elle explicite la diversification des des approvisionnements, et c'est un fournisseur parmi d'autres, et donc un acte de ce fait dans une politique où les fournisseurs peuvent être interchangeables selon les conjonctures. Là, inversement, ce que je regarde, c'est l'éventualité d'une dépendance 
de l'Afrique à l'égard de la Chine. Et j'ai pris les pays dont les, les exportations à destination de la Chine représentent au moins 10% de leurs exportations. 10% étant le chiffre moyen pour l'Afrique dans son entier. Et vous avez une quinzaine de pays qui sont dans des situations variables, mais vous voyez que l'on ne peut pas pour ces pays dessiner un schéma qui se reproduirait d'un pays à l'autre. La situation de chacun des pays est différente, et donc on va se trouver dans une situation où on va être obligé d'analyser l'indépendance, non pas du continent dans son ensemble, mais l'indépendance par rapport à chacun des pays tel qu'elle peut se créer. Alors, si j'essaye de conclure pour ce, ce que j'essaie de présenter de façon très rapide là, hein, vous avez un certain nombre d'asymétries dans les relations entre la Chine et l'Afrique. La première asymétrie, c'est une asymétrie entre la Chine et le continent africain. Si le continent africain est une réalité économique en tant que telle. En fait, vous avez 53 pays hein, qui sont en face et qui peuvent avoir des situations totalement différentes. Et il importe déjà de ce fait d'aborder la situation de ces pays les uns indépendamment des autres. Mais non seulement on est obligé de faire cette distinction, mais on est obligé de faire une distinction entre l'importance économique ou le rôle de l'économie et le rôle du politique. Mais même dans l'économie, vous avez ici une nécessité de distinguer deux catégories de pays par rapport au sujet de cette conférence. Si nous prenons les investissements, hein, vous avez des investissements chinois qui sont faits dans le cadre d'un projet qui est qualifié de nouvelle route de la soie. Il n'y a qu'un seul pays africain qui soit dans ce cadre. C'est l'Égypte. C'est le seul pays qui soit, dont une partie des investissements chinois sont qualifiés comme étant des projets haute de la soie. Les autres pays africains, vous avez des investissements plus ou moins importants, mais ça n'entre pas dans, la de, dans cette étiquette-là. Donc, déjà ici, hein, on est amené, au, on, on doit avoir une autre perspective, hein, même du point de vue économique, on ne peut pas avoir une perspective unique. Alors, ce qui fait que, si l'on constate, comme je le disais tout à l'heure, si l'on reprend la constatation, comme quoi il y a environ 7 ou 8 pays qui, à un titre et à un autre, ou à un autre, sont considérés comme participants, on se rend bien compte à ce moment-là qu'il y a d'autres choses qui sont en jeu et sont effectivement les facteurs politiques. Alors cette asymétrie, on la retrouve aussi dans les institutions chinoises, en ce sens que vous avez une opposition entre la stratégie qui peut être celle du ministère des Affaires étrangères et la stratégie qui peut être celle du ministère du Commerce. Et vous pouvez aller au-delà, vous avez effectivement deux discours qui apparaissent, un discours que j'appellerais de mercantilisme, hein, dont je, que, que j'expose dans mon papier, où le, la, la, le, le, fonction, le haut fonctionnaire écrit que il encourage les entreprises chinoises à aller en Asie pour investir et pour commercer, il encourage celles-ci pour à commercer pour aller dans, le continent, dans, dans les anciens pays de l'Est, mais les décourage à aller en Afrique. Et cela est confirmé d'ailleurs avec la vision que l'ont les entrepreneurs chinois. Vous avez cette étude qui a été faite par le think tank qui est dirigé par euh, les Nifou, qui a interrogé environ 600 entreprises chinoises qui ont des problèmes de coût et qui pourraient envisager de se délocaliser. En fait, vous avez une petite minorité hein, qui envisagerait de se délocaliser hors de Chine, hein, et éventuellement se délocaliser en Chine, mais pas beaucoup sur le beaucoup pour le Chine, et celles, et les deux seules qui pourraient envisager d'aller en Afrique, ce sont des entreprises chinoises à capitaux non chinois. Donc, si vous voulez, de tous ces points de vue-là, hein, il y a, dirons-nous, une vision économique relativement faible, où une importance économique qui est accordée à l'Afrique est très faible, mais de l'autre côté, vous avez autre chose qui apparaît, c'est l'analyse ou la vision de, de la, des réformes chinoises, la réforme en trois temps, l'ouverture dans les années 70, 80, 90, suivie par l'entrée à, à l'OMC, et aujourd'hui, cette fameuse route de la soie. Et vous avez tout un discours, dans ce discours de route de la soie, qui voit dire, qui, qui dit, face au protectionnisme américain et face au protectionnisme euh, européen, l'Afrique et la Chine doivent s'unir. 
Et si vous voulez, c'est un message qui semble très bien reçu par l'Afrique. Le, le président euh, temporel qui vient d'arriver à Pékin a déclaré la Chine, enfin, l'Afrique se donne à la Chine.
Still there are challenges on both fronts and the dispute, though it is amenable, but still continues. In spite of all these undercurrents, the India-China trade has increased, though Indian foreign policy is always being uh, weighed and uh, changed looking at the Chinese action. There are basic differences between China and India in such that the Chinese leadership wants to forge ahead aggressively, whereas Indian development and the Indian policy on development is still not clear. Indian policy might undergo a radical change under Prime Minister Modi, but currently it is more focused on Hindu and the domestic problems. Uh, BRN is aimed at promoting connectivity and I could think of three reasons why the connectivity is being promoted. First being to connect the regional imbalances within China, to find market for the low cost manufacturing base of China and also to find market for all over production. After the concept of connectivity was put at the world forum by China, India took certain countermeasures as in China expands into the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. India has moved ahead to get closer ties with USA, Japan, Australia and Vietnam. It is contributing to the development of the Asia-Africa growth corridor and it is also contributing to the developing the port of Jawahar in Iran to supplement Pakistan which is supposed to be the strongest ally of China. India is also developing the northeastern regions which were left undeveloped strategically after the 62 war. The South Asian regions holds many challenges for Chinese for the development plan that the China has presented to the world. It plans to list the countries which are mostly undeveloped. They have low infrastructure, low per capita income, and no doubt investment can make a great difference to these regions. Members of South Asia face controversies, and SARC has not been able to do much about it. There is a need to develop consensus. Chinese proposal can no doubt reshape the economic order, but it can also be unjust and unfair to the developing country. Geopolitical tensions with powers like India can affect the smooth implementation, and countries involved in the BRI are in economic transition. Now, this economic transition and economic growth can also influence the internal politics in this country, and Chinese company may or may not be aware of such kind of politics and there may be unintended consequences. Underdeveloped market economies face corruption, arms safety problems, terrorism is also an important challenge and it is also debatable whether the Silk Road would work in today's time. The Indian perspective. India's main uh, contention, India has stayed away from the BRI citing sovereignty as a reason and the main reason is the China-Pakistan economic corridor and India feels it is their main reason for non-participation. India requires sensitivity towards the claims in Pakistan. Maritime understanding with Sri Lanka, sale of eight subways to Pakistan, increase of facilities in the Gwadar port, all this forces India to look at this as an initiative, as an ambition for hegemony rather than an economic perspective. The funding of BRI also remains undefined and investments in many countries as discussed earlier have not been showing good returns and financial institutions may or may not want to risk, risk the as the decay rates of return are yet not clear. And cooperation between governments at such a large scale to some extent reflect an utopian vision. And India feels that the promise of loans and development partnerships are being used over political independence and sovereignty and for strategic leverage. Uh, what India expects? India expects more constructive participation. It looks towards stable and sustainable global economy. Uh, India definitely looks forward to resolving existing disputes and development should be pursued as a common goal. India views China's investments in Kashmir as a violation of its sovereignty and it steps to restrict the rise of India as a global power. The connectivity in Asia must be consultative, financially transparent and respectful to the sovereignty. This is what is the main expectation of my country. 
and how we should abide by the other established principles of international law and the stakeholders' goals and projects need to be better defined. Uh, what steps India has been taking or needs to be taken? India should also continue to build its connectivity at a faster pace. The economic cord, the BCI economic corridor needs to be developed in the eastern and the northwestern regions. We should take lessons from Japan and to uh, deal with all the investments from case to case basis rather than being a new spectator. And to some extent, in avoid any kind of conflict in the South Asian region and the Indian Ocean. India can negotiate the CPC projects and the strategic issues with possibility of cooperation in infrastructure should be discussed and we should, India should not be completely close to the concept. India has already signaled to the world that it is a strategically independent country and I feel it is justified in staying out of the initiative until its concerns are addressed. The dispute of border should be settled and we expect a con some consistency towards the Kashmir, Kashmir issue. It, and on the other hand, India also needs to think not only about the geopolitical issues but also the geoeconomic issues. The government has already taken steps to stall the thaw and we should see how we can uh, take advantage of this project. The claim to POK is politically useful but it does not help in any way. The government will like to go by the policy of the erstwhile PM that borders cannot be changed but they can be made irrelevant because if the project materializes in a big way, India's detachment would not be possible. Uh, no doubt BRI shall uh, benefit the landlocked states of Central Asia and provide new trade routes but we have to see that cooperation and economic growth should be promoted and we should acquire and abandon our association with geopolitics and look towards the different world. The project should not be used for political supremacy but for the greater good of our political and social causes. This is not to say that India should not seek any clarification for building. India should state its claim in transformation. Indian China should ensure that their political differences do not affect economic cooperation. The cooperation has started reflecting somewhere, but this does not mean that the sense of Bangladesh has done away with all problems. The border is to stay, and so does the Lama. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, all of you. And now we open the floor to questions. Is there any question? And please try to be like one question and concise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Aaron? Uh, Eric Lundgren, just to kick things off. Uh, I had a question about the Kenya Railroad Project. I was reading something this past week about it. There was an expose um, to the treatment of Kenyan workers on the project. I'm curious you know, if you have any insights into that, particularly if this kind of you know, bad press, uh, if you think that will impact how the Chinese companies behave. And maybe unpacking just a little bit of you know, to what extent is it a state-owned enterprise solely? To what extent are there other Chinese contractors involved that maybe are more or less susceptible to this, you know, international pressure or media pressure? Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah, on there. Yes, um, Jerry, uh, I had a question for you because. Uh, Alicia um, uh, Garcia Herrero from Bruegel has published a, a paper showing that actually the FDI uh, of China into Africa could be actually bigger than the official statistics suggest because of course the MOFCOM does not consider the reinvestment of local subsidiary as FDI, and according to her, in the case of Africa, it could be quite substantial. So I wanted to have your idea on 
is the style sheets used by the MOFCOM really uh, not uh, reliable for Africa at all, or could they underestimate the real effect of African of Chinese investment in Africa? Thank you. Thank you. There was a woman there in the middle. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Soraya Carla from Colombia. I'm the director of the Center of Research on India and South Asia in Estonia, Colombia University. And I have a question for uh, Madam. Uh, I would like to know, uh, India is already investing in COVID-19 in Africa. And uh, China has announced also uh, the expansion of the uh, initiative to Latin America. So, of course, Latin American countries have a bad experience with the Chinese investment in the region, Venezuela, for instance. And uh, we, I would like to know if, Ch if India could be a, a financial actor in Latin American region, taking into account that uh, you are already there uh, doing business in different countries in Latin America. Thank you. Was one there? Quick, so that we can get more questions, please. Uh, I'll be very brief. My name is Jeffrey Harris. I'm a former official of the European Parliament, and I've been various fellowships and other things looking at EU-China-America relations. And my question is whether the relative disengagement of the United States actually makes all this uh, BRI easier uh, for China than it might have been. Of course, uh, you know, the last speaker mentioned that maybe we should more attention. I think you said we should give more attention to geoeconomics than to geopolitics. But of course, the TPP and the other actions which the Chinese interpreted as some kind of provocation uh, lie at the basis of the 2013 initiative uh, by President Xi. So the fact that these initiatives failed and that the current <coughs> president of the US is now on a very, very different trajectory uh, doesn't it mean that a lot of these sort of critical, hard look at uh, what the BRI really amounts to uh, is easier to overcome precisely because of, of this uh, new situation, shall we call it? Thank you. One, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. So, no? Okay. Here? Okay. Two, two more. Okay, we can start here from the front and then go back to the uh, lady. Thank you, Astrid Skanda from GSF Germany. I have a question to Professor Singh from India. Um, I remember that uh, in the uh, summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which had already been mentioned earlier here, India and now also Pakistan was uh, participating at the Qingdao summit in June. So and I do remember that the BRI was on the agenda at the time, at least this, I happened to be in China at that time. So it was said that um, this was a sign of the more positive engagement of, uh, of India towards uh, the BRI. So uh, I would like to know your view on that. Thank you. Then one last question and then Uh, thank you. So first, I want to say a few words to Professor uh, Uzibash. And I hope I pronounce your name correctly. So uh, because I was uh, living in Ethiopia for nine months, so I understand the context in Africa. And from your presentation, um, I, I do agree that uh, we have to refer to the context of different countries in, in Africa. And China's approach in different countries may be different uh, according to the different contexts. Um, so, um, so, so I think uh, we can't give uh, general conclusions or judgment uh, regarding um, BRI and even uh, even uh, on one single comment. Uh, and then my question is for Indian professor. Um, so uh, from uh, the first presentation until now, I I could feel the fear from. Um, either Japan or India <coughs> or even broadly other parts of the world, uh, the fear of the rising of China. 
But um, always China emphasizes that uh, um, it follows the principle of uh, uh, peaceful coexistence and non-interference. And also the BRI, um, yeah, okay. so the precondition is, uh, um, is peace, security, uh, one-one cooperation, and common prosperity. So I'm wondering, um, where is the fear from? So um, uh, the rest part of the world doesn't trust China or, um, or doesn't understand China very well. Thank you. Can you do the last point, please, sir? Yeah, the last one. And then we have to here in the front. I have a very quick question. Yeah. Very good. yeah. It's a question to all of you. When you visit the inland ports in China that are supposed to support trade across the borders, we are not allowed in. For example, along Kashgar to the Pakistan Karakum Highway, there are several inland ports. We were not even allowed to stick to stop with the car and take a photo of it. Why are we not allowed in? We want to go there and see how trade works along the Silk Road. So that's a question for all of you. Just comment. Thank you very much. And so now I hand the microphone to Professor Singh, and then we we'll just uh, go back. Very clear. Yes, the first question regarding the business prospects in India and Latin America. The Indian foreign policy is undergoing definitely a change, and it is only a matter of time whether it will clear what India thinks about it and how we decide to proceed about the matter. And the second question about the what is the place of US in the, lab, in the whole rivalry process. India is moving ahead to thaw certain relations. Again, how this will manage it will be only by the times to come. Uh, about the question here from the first, second row about the summit in 2017. India, as far as I know, in May 2017, India has stayed away from the summit, citing sovereignty as the reasons and the uh, national interest. But after the meeting of PM Modi with the Chinese president, they have definitely agreed that they would make they would make efforts to improve the relations. How far it is going to go ahead and how far both the countries can manage their energy and pay attention to the geoeconomics that is to be seen. Though it is felt that the Indian foreign policy will go a radical change under PM Modi. Now regarding the fear that is there, the fear is not of a country as such in India. The fear is maintaining its own sovereignty. Not fear, only a caution. That is my question. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. En ce qui l'investissement direct à l'étranger, il faut remarquer d'abord que toutes les statistiques posent problème. Et de ce point de vue-là, je ne suis pas sûr que le système de collecte chinois soit plus mauvais que ceux que nous avons par ailleurs dans la mesure où les flux sont beaucoup plus contrôlés. Par ailleurs, pour la remarque spécifique faite par Madame Guerrero, qui concerne donc la non comptabilisation de de, du réinvestissement des bénéfices, euh, cette même remarque peut être faite pour tous les pays. Et du point de vue méthodologique, vous constaterez que je ne vous ai pas mis un tableau des investissements, des flux, je vous ai mis des courbes de tendance. Autrement dit, que ces courbes de tendance, elles représentent une évolution qui peut se faire avec un investissement supérieur ou un investissement inférieur. Donc il y a un problème de méthodologie derrière, il y a des problèmes de déficience, et je vous rappellerai que Rostat a énormément de mal à rassembler les statistiques des pays membres de l'Europe pour calculer ce qu'ils peuvent effectivement investir à l'extérieur. Donc nous sommes dans, un, dans une perspective relativement euh, aléatoire. Mais il y a des tendances. Et ce sont ces tendances, c'est à partir de ces tendances que j'essaie d'analyser le phénomène et d'aboutir aux conclusions. Je voudrais faire une remarque aussi sur le rôle des États-Unis pour savoir s'il si rend les choses plus difficiles ou plus aisées. Je crois en fait que du point de vue de l'Afrique, il y a aujourd'hui une situation nouvelle qui a effectivement été déclenchée par l'activisme chinois, en ce sens que les pays africains ont compris qu'ils avaient en face de non pas seulement les partenaires traditionnels, mais toute une, 
série, toute une palette de fournisseurs auxquels ils pouvaient choisir de s'adresser en fonction de leurs besoins. Et en fait, ils ont ainsi compris que c'était pour eux, eux l'occasion de réaliser ou d'achever leurs indépendances qu'ils n'avaient pas encore complètement fait. Alors qu'un qu pays euh, se retire ou ne se retire pas, la conséquence ne peut être qu'un petit peu l'accélération de ce processus. Et comme je disais tout à l'heure, je vous rappelle la phrase de Caboré, président du Burkina Faso, qui était juste de reconnaître la Chine, l'Afrique a choisi la Chine. So in terms of the um, methodology of um, Ofcom and um, Western methodology, um, uh, Professor Perrault said that actually Eurostat um, has also, there's also some issues in terms of connecting the methodology in Eurostat. So um, both can be questionable, both methodology. And um, in terms of the uh, US investment, um, African countries uh, are able to have a choice um, uh, in terms of the range of investments, um, they, they of acquiring investments. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the main thing, I hope. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, sorry, this is a uh, number of questions. And I know uh, there's the lunch waiting, this is probably the most important question. <laughs> to to our, our, our Chinese uh, colleague, uh, um, thank you for the question. Uh, I wanted to say um, that you're right, and obviously you, because, uh, because you're saying the same thing as I was saying, that the context is very important. <coughs> But I think there's one issue that is all over the place for BI for China. The challenge is that China's policy is very much government focused. And that is not only true for the companies, but it's also true for the, let's say, the embassies of China. They don't really talk to NGOs or society that much. They only talk to government. And I think this is where I, I was trying to make a point also in my paper. The agency of the, of the, say, the African host countries is, is very different. And I'm coming to that question because that's, that's one of the issues. I mean, you talk to the government uh, and you make a deal, and you assume, like in China, if the government says that, everything is fine. The problem is that most governments in Africa are not really that supported by their, by their, uh, by their citizens, and, and they have lots of different opinions, and there's ethnic issues, and so on and so forth. So that inevitably leads to trouble. If the analysis of the situation in the country is not encompassing, not civil society necessarily the way it's organized, but civil society in the, in, in, the, in the sense that what are the political, economic, social dynamics that, that, are, that are in the country. Now, companies that have been in a particular country for a long time, they know that. They learn it on the job, so to speak. And, uh, and in Kenya, for instance, that company has learned quite obviously because, and I'm, I'm coming to that question, they have actually included in their project um, a CSR strategy, corporate social responsibility strategy. They've hired local advisors to work with in order to sort out conflicts with the local population to make sure that the workers they're hiring are reflecting the composition, the ethnic composition of the area to avoid problems. And whenever like locals got excited, <coughs> because locals usually, I mean, as, as it's always the case, and the government decides something that doesn't inform the local population because, I mean, we the government, you know, we just do what we want. And the government and the, the, the local population, they see the Chinese people hopping around, starting to dig, and they say, what are you, what are you doing here? They have no idea. So they, they established these communication channels, and whenever there was a problem, you know, they, they did something. They renovated a church, or they built a little bridge to help the locals. So that was quite, uh, quite, a, quite an important uh, component. So if, if a company knows the country, I think they have a bit of an advantage here. Now the labor issues that you mentioned are, are a bit complicated obviously to analyze because you would have to, to, be, to be accurate, you would have to actually do lots of big surveys and stuff like that to, to come up with, with, with real answers. And that's obviously difficult to do. But the topic that you brought up is, is something that's happened fairly recently. There was a, uh, a post somewhere uh, that the Chinese uh, uh, workers, or the managers rather, 
on the SGR, on the Stalin Gate Railway Project, they were sort of being racist towards the Kenyans because they didn't invite them to the table to eat, they took different buses when they left the, uh, uh, the, the, the construction site, etc., etc. And of course, here you, you're touching a very raw nerve and, 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 and uh, red line for, for African countries, and that's racism. And, and, and here the Chinese are very insensitive to, to what had happened. Now, but I can understand, probably China didn't have any sort of racist idea. I mean, they were just sitting there having lunch or, or dinner, and of course they, they have a language barrier. Uh, there is a barrier between the management and the local workers and stuff like that. So different management cultures, different industrial relations cultures that inevitably lead to conflicts. Now, the reaction on the social media on, on this was quite interesting, because when you saw the Kenyan citizens' comments, uh, there, were no, there, there were no less racist than they accused the Chinese to be. I mean, they called them ching chongs that eat cats, dogs, and our wildlife. Uh, so all sorts of prejudices came out against the Chinese, but the government then took, um, took some measures, um, revoking uh, work permits for Chinese workers who didn't speak Kiswahili or English. You know, there was a, there was a strong reaction because it's, 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 it's a very, very uh, important issue. So this, this is a problem, and this is where links back to what I said, if you don't really understand what's going on, it is very, very difficult for the company to avoid these kind of things. Now more sort of, and just a minute, uh, in, in terms of how they organize the labor relations, I mean, I had a couple of conversations at the time they were, they were building the railway. Um, one of the issues, for instance, was Chinese manager was complaining about some of the workers being extremely aggressive and damaging um, the camp because the management had refused to grant them the request to have milk instead of water in the canteen for lunch. Because in the contract it said they have water and they don't have milk. And the company management said, okay, we stick to what's in the agreement. And the workers just got really angry <laughs> to destroy um, a water pipe and whatnot. And then you had ethnic issues as well. Some of the workers are saying, uh, uh, you know, we are not getting our community, the Maasai community doesn't get the jobs. It's the Gamma community next door that gets the jobs. Well, the Chinese was department that the Maasai workers were not as good as the Gamba workers uh, in terms of productivity. And, uh, you know, so that led to, uh, to riots. Uh, the police intervened, uh, and then the issue was settled uh, at the highest level, and then some quotas were read. So there's a lot of these little issues that come up. It, to make it systematic, it's very, very difficult. So it's more anecdotal evidence. But they're clearly industrial relations conflicts, I think, that are normal. And then you have these other issues which are more political and more cultural. Uh, in, 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 and that works both ways, I think. So thank you very much for your presentation and for questions and answers. And now it's time for lunch. So thank Yes, but... Oh, he's up his...